The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code RGAME to get yourself 10% off. Hello and welcome to the Hurling Show. It's myself and Michael Verney. He's just finished the yogurt. How are you getting on, Michael? <laughs> How are you saying? Good now. I'm not too bad. Looking forward to this big weekend of Hurling? Yeah, really looking forward to it, Dan. Clareham, Clareham Waterford is really, really intriguing. I think the injuries that we're probably going to talk about make it even more interesting. And Dublin Antrim, I think there's two huge games in particular. Those two games really stand out this weekend. There's an awful lot on the line for the counties involved there. Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick sort of uh, perusal over the fixtures that are coming this weekend. As I said already, Dublin Antrim, uh, Leash, Wexford, Waterford, Clare, all of those, and Liam McCarthy. Joe McDonough, there's a couple of fixtures, as and there's single fixtures in the Christie Ring, Nicky Rackard, and the Laurie Maher. We're going to talk about all of it, as we always do. And as we love to encourage our viewers, please get your questions, your comments in, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, or uh, or Twitter, we'll get to those comments. Just we'll, saying, uh, uh, the 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 reaction to you only getting one tip man in the top ten hurlers was an absolute joy to behold. Well, I hope that that has digitally been put up in the wall in Dr. Morris Park and Tipperary is going to come out and shove it up to the lottie because uh, tip her back, as I love to say every year, tip her back. It's it's funny, like you, there was only one tip man in it. He was obviously in a tree. Like there was no Dublin player. There was no Wexford player. There was no Waterford player. So whatever about, like you thinking, Tip could take motivation. I'd say there's a fair few other counties that only shove it, shove it up the arse of those two hour game boys. I'd say it will be the mantra in a lot of dressing rooms. And, but isn't it now, from this weekend, that we're going to start seeing the fire in the belly in some of these teams? Because, you know, there's an element of shadow boxing, or at least a question mark over the, whether there was shadow boxing or not, up until this point. But now, you know, it's all on the line now. We're going to see exactly what Clare have, what Watford have, and so on and so forth. So that's great. Yeah, and I think, like, the, you know, people are maybe bemoaning maybe the lack of physicality in hurling or whatever, but, like, there's going to be lads in each other's faces. Like, it's champ it's championship hurling. Like, Clare and Watford, I do expect a high-scoring game, but I also expect a lot of big, robust tackles, a lot of lads getting in each other's faces. I don't expect lads to be floating around getting free shots or anything like that. It's, it's championship hurling. Like, in the league... We talked about the high scoring uh, nature of the league. There were many factors in that, but th there was nothing really at play. Everything is at play from now on. And, yeah. you know, there's just, it's just, I, I really, really looking forward to it. I think th there's been negative talk probably about her. And I think this, this year's championship could absolutely explode into action this weekend. Yeah. And as, as I said, we're brought to you by the Bamboo Hurley from Torpy. Get 10% off with the promo code our game. The, the Bamboo the... will be flying this weekend. I can guarantee you that. It, it sure will. And it's going to travel in this weather. Uh, also, if you want to get this on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. You get all the audio podcasts there, a fiver a month to support the channel and don't forget uh, we do the online club fundraisers if your club needs to raise funds this year go to events at our game.ie we'll put on a big show for you and make lots of money for the club so we'll uh, one of the first things that you and i wanted to talk about was the fact that there's not going to be seven subs we had seen that for the league brian lohan he wasn't happy and he goes um on the seven substitutions i was listening to kerry football manager peter Keane the other day and what he said about it made a lot of sense he pointed out that a lot of teams have picked up soft tissue injuries in what has been a condensed national league i think he and uh, Liam are right the way the game has gone now it takes so much out of fellas physically and mentally that a couple of extra substitutions would be no harm at all particularly when the championship is more intense again than the league uh, it is what it is now, and we'll all have to get on with the rules as they are. But having said that, I'd be in favour of keeping that option of seven subs for the championship. I wouldn't. I mean, I get it from a player welfare point of view, but it really does. Maybe it was one of these things that was adding to kind of breaking up games, slowing it down. I know you had to use all your seven subs within, you know, the five allotted stoppages for that. But um, I don't know that it, at this point, you know, you've, you've had the few weeks to, to sort all that out if you overloaded your players or if it was your mismanagement that got them injured, at this point, you just kind of have to soak it up and get on with it. 
I think it's a tricky one now, to be honest. Um, I just think the you know the league and the way the championship is this year, it it is just a bit different, and I think there are different circumstances. Just say, for example, uh, just say Connor Prunty and Jamie Barn and Gleason and Five start this weekend, and all of a sudden. Uh, two of them are gone after 20 minutes with, you know, a recurrence of injuries or whatever. And then Waterford only have three subs left, not taken into the natural occurrence of, you know, fresh injuries, fatigue, uh, concussion, whatever, whatever it is, loads of different things that could happen. And all of a sudden you're left with 15 or 20 minutes uh, left in a championship game and somebody goes down and they have to stand in the corner like Shawnee McMahon did with one, with one shoulder in, in 95, which was one of the, you know, one of the catalysts to, to Claire probably winning the All Ireland, but I just think it's I just think I I don't see why they couldn't have extended it to seven. That's just my own personal view, just because I think the attrition rates of how quickly they play games during the league and the nature of carrying knocks and stuff into championship. I just think it's a little different. I'm not saying that they needed seven subs the whole time, but I just think it was a little bit different this year. There was probably extenuating circumstances and maybe they could have brought it into the championship. From a journalist's point of view, it's a disaster. So I'd, I'd be happy from that point of view, at least, you know, when the five are there, there's not rolling on guys near the end when you're under a lot of pressure with deadlines and stuff like that. But I just think it, it would help managers and players a small bit. And the only thing I'd say about it as well, Shane, is there's 26 togged out on championship. I, I don't know. Should, should, should there be more opportunity for the 26 that tug out on a championship or on a league day to actually play, like only 20 can play at the moment. Should there be more? Should we should we be encouraging uh, more guys to have an opportunity to play on a given day? If they don't want to use them, they don't have to. But you know, it's just it's just just something else to kind of throw into the mix as well. Yeah, but traditionally in major soccer tournaments, you have your three subs, but absolutely everyone on the panel could be on the bench. You know, those that aren't starting. You've kind of mentioned there that. What happens if Austin Gleeson and Connor Prunty get injured early on? Because, or sorry, Shane Fives get injured early on because they have been doubts or we're carrying knocks coming into it. Well, then as a manager, you really have to consider: Do I start these players or not? It is a difficult one, but I don't know. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, there's a comment in from Adrian McGrath. I can't uh, put put the comment up on screen because his last word is a little bit tasty. And you know, there's kids watching this show. Connor Prunty will be playing all that injury stuff. Is uh, it's an expletive. So it, it, look, the, uh, we'll come to that point, actually. Joe, you know we'll jump straight to it. One of the things I was going to say is, who marks Aaron Shanahan if Conor Prunty isn't there? Because ostensibly, at least, his big guy should be able to take care of him in the air. But the flip side is, Shanahan did an awful lot of damage on Prunty last year at Parky Cueve in the All-Ireland Qualifier game. Uh, did he score two goals that day? Yeah, 2-1, yeah. Yeah, and, he, one, yeah. and he, he won a ball out um, around the 45 and maybe put a crossfield ball for Aidan McCarthy to slash another one into the top corner. So trying to look after him now, uh, you know, I just wonder who would play there if either Conor Prunty can't start or if he can't last the game. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, Conor Gleeson's obviously been redirected to the full back line. He's been playing corner back in, in most of the games. He could end, potentially end up full end up full back. If they had Tyg de Borca available, I'd imagine near the daily would probably slip back full back. I don't think I don't think they could move daily from centre back. He's played well in those couple of games. I don't think they'd make that big of a move that they'd put him back three and then have to bring in, you know, maybe another new person six, or maybe Austin Gleason goes into six. I think that's an awful lot of change. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? I'm when a change needs to be made. I'm all for making one change for that position and not making three or four. Uh, I was actually chatting to who was I chatting to? Chatting to Lee McHale last week about about John Mahan, and he was just saying that you know in '96 and even in '97 when somebody was out, Mahan even admitted that he made three or four changes to fix one position and it can kind of mess things up and sometimes you're taking guys out of their best position to try and jig things around i think moving someone in full back and just making that one switch is probably the best thing to do but funny enough as you say prunty did, didn't go particularly well on channel last year prunty was in all-star form before that claire game had been brilliant on galan in the monster final so like maybe maybe he's not naturally suited to him anyway and maybe someone else would do a better job on him but I think the fact that, that Shane O'Donnell's not going to be there as well does help Waterford's case a bit. You're taking away another inside threat. It, it would look like, while they might have Ryan Taylor or somebody else inside, it would look like that long ball to Shannon is one of their main outlets in that full forward line. So Waterford are going to need someone who's fairly decent in the air. Would it be like, 
would it be a runner that Kevin Moran could slip back? Maybe I'm not sure. It's it's interest. It'd be interesting to see what they do, though. But it kind of tells you everything you need to know about Kevin Moran that that even crossed your mind. And you know, I, I hear you say it, and I'm like, oh, you wouldn't want to. But then again, he's a sort of a guy you could trust. He's good in the air. He's so experienced. He'd probably know how to spoil the man. And if you look at the other options that are there, right? So Shane Fives, maybe he's going to be okay to play the game. He would seem like the natural next guy to go to. Connor Gleeson has obviously played in the full back line. Sometimes well, sometimes I, I rather seen him out the field. Size profile wise, not sure that, that that particularly suits him. Ian Kenny, again, combative player, good hurler, not sure size wise. Shane McNulty, the same. He probably would be more likely of, of that group, even though they're all a similar size profile. And after that, you just wouldn't be sure. I mean, Caleb Lyons may mark Tony Kelly, and you could make a case that if Kelly decides, right, I'm just going to play corner forward, so that that would decommission arguably Waterford's best deep attack attacking weapon. So he could, you could imagine him playing fullback, but it would feel like a massive waste of what's so good about this Waterford team that they can run straight up the centre from from anywhere in the field, really. So. Would he be in contention? Uh, you know, I mean, it's obviously one of these things where Liam Cattle has to look at the entire thing, look at every player he has, who can play where, right, can I afford to put Caleb Lyons back there? Will I put Kevin Moran back there? So um, it, that's a tough one. And I think there's tough ones on both sides. You mentioned Shane O'Donnell being out as well, uh, a concussion. I mean, that's that's serious enough stuff if it's keeping him out this length of time and we wish him well. But there, there's definitely conundrums on both sides. There definitely is. Uh, the Caleb Lyons one is an interesting one. You know, it wasn't you know the real Tony Kelly when they played when they played last year, and Lyons kind of dominated. And he obviously picked up that ankle knock at the start of a game. Yeah. With the best will in the world, you're you're just not going to be you're not going to be the player uh, that you normally are. He was visibly visibly limping, despite what other people, some commentators said, he was struggling and he was never going to be himself. Especially like you have to be one hundred percent coming up against Caleb Lyons, particularly athletically, to even stay with him. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, as you say, Lyons would have to forego his probably best attributes as in going forward and being able to score to kind of quench Tony Kelly's threat. So it's going to be interesting to see there. When you were talking, I'm just wondering, like, is there a possibility then that if Prunty doesn't play, I think Prunty was running in straight lines at Waterford training the other night and only running at about 50%. So he, he does look under pressure. Is there a possibility that Kelly goes in around Shannon and Hoover's in around that full forward line uh, and they go after the full back line and potentially with two rookie players in there, just say if Conor Gleeson is full back uh, on Shannon and has a size disadvantage and Caleb Lyons is put in, into that full back line as well and Kelly Hoover's around him and they try to go to town in that instance so that's going to be really interesting um, the role of Ira Daly is huge there then providing a shield to that full back line as well and they just can't be left exposed but there's a lot of interesting questions and a lot of interesting matchups uh, to look forward to without a doubt yeah, so uh, plenty of comments coming in, and as always, get them in and let us know your thoughts on the game. Lionel Strongjaw, given that it sounds like Conor Prunty is going to miss the clear game, who do you think would be full back? So yeah, we're definitely trying to work through that. Chris Connell and Tony Kelly is way better than Austin Gleeson. Tony Kelly is probably the best hurler in the country at the moment, and of course <laughs> did, we did that. Did we mention Austin Gleeson, or is, this, is Chris just stating his opinion? Uh, I think Chris is just going straight in with the opinion and, and keep him coming, Chris. He's a regular comment on, commenter on YouTube. Uh, Lisa S. videos, Adrian McGrath, I don't know, they were saying Prunty is doubtful and Barron, of course, Jamie Barron as well, if he's not available, that's a massive one. But even just to tease out the point that you made there about having Tony Kelly inside with um, Aaron Shanahan, then who plays in the half forward line? And I'm just looking through, let's say, the, the game against uh, Dublin a couple of weeks ago, and Clare put up 34 points that day in a win in, in Parnell Park, and they were very, very impressive. And around midfield, you had Colin Malone there, you had Tony, or sorry, Colin Galvin, who, you know, the couple of games I've watched him against both Dublin and Kilkenny, we know how good he is, but he's been out a long time, and I'm not sure he felt the weight of the ball more than five times between the two games. So that's a big conundrum for for Brian Lowe and does he start him? But anyway, if he if he if he persists with Galvin, Cahill Malone, and maybe Galvin midfield certainly sounds good if they're both playing well. Then the half forward line, I, I'd imagine Aidan McCarthy's that certainly going to be there. Maybe Ian Galvin, maybe somebody like just looking at the the team that selected the last day. Tony Kelly would have been out there. Shane O'Donnell played that day. Aaron Shanahan and maybe Mark Rogers. Can they afford to have both Shanahan and? And Tony Kelly inside. 
certainly Aidan McCarthy is a top player to have in the half forward line on form. But do they, do they have enough lads on form around the, the middle eight to be able to afford to put those two lads inside? Will the ball uh, get to them? Yeah, it depends, uh, Shane. If, if it's, you know, the clear intended game plan that they're going to get ball inside to the two lads as often as is humanly possible, and that's going to be, and lads aren't going to be kind of dilly-dallying without the pitch, I think they probably can. You could probably throw maybe David Reedy into the mix there as well, and potentially David Fitzgerald could push back up if that's if that's the way they're looking. But I think they can, and for stages anyway. You know, make Waterford maybe be uncomfortable in that full back lane. Then you can, if you know, if the ball is drying up going inside, you can send Kelly on kind of a Roman roll. Maybe put someone different, put a Ryan Taylor, put a Mark Rogers inside around Shannon as well. I think it's important probably to have someone beaver and around Shannon. But it's just going to be interesting to see what what way they go about it. It's funny, like all the talk about Clare, you know, before the league started and then when Antrim beat them, you know, they're on a downward curve and this rubbish that they're going to be the next Offaly and all this kind of crack. And all of a sudden now, you know, you know, they beat Dublin, putting up a big score in the league. They beat Kilkenny in the league. Like, they're coming in with plenty of optimism. And I know O'Donnell is out, and I know there's uh, David McInerney's probably 50-50. I don't really see him starting because he hasn't played enough league. He might he might come in. I think he had a quad injury, and now he's a groin injury. I think both are, are related. But, like, they're coming in with, you know, a swell of optimism. You you would have to say it. They really, really fancy their, fancy their chances. And just... Something I'd ask you as well, like if you're looking at like I always kind of kind of think, you know, what does a, a given player have to do on a given day for a team to win? And you're just thinking, what does Tony Kelly have to score for Claire to win? How well does he have to play for them to win? Like, what sort of a tally does he have to put up? If like much of the focus is going to be on him, if he has one of those game of games, they're going to be very hard beaten. Like, but what sort of a tally do you think he needs to put up for Claire to win here? Uh, well, he, you'd imagine he's going to be having to look at five points from play anyway and maybe get a goal in there somewhere along the line too. He'll he'll be hitting the freeze, of course, so you could be 10 or 15 freeze in there. But you want that clear forward line to be able to run at Watford and sort of draw fouls at them. And, you know, as we've kind of alluded to, there's, a, there's certainly going to be weaknesses in that Watford back line, or there should be, based on the absences there. So if you're if you're able to get ball in, uh, early into Shanahan, good quality ball. Like if it's that sort of high hanging diagonal one where he can either lean back into his man or sort of attack it gently in front of him and hold his man off, that's going to lead to freeze because you can't allow him to just turn or feed it off to Reedy, like you said, or Tony Kelly coming through. I think Kelly's going to probably have to put up the guts of 15 points anyway, whether it's between freeze and from play. And, um, do you think there there's enough around him to be able to add to that? Like Shane O'Donnell's a massive miss uh, loss for this game, but he, he, especially when he's been out in the half forward line, it's not like he's been putting up massive score lines. So you just need someone with maybe the level of industry he might might have and maybe be able to pinch a point too. That's obviously downplaying his significance a nice bit. He's a really really good player, mm. but you just want to make sure that someone doesn't massively let the side down rather than trying to play to his level. Yeah, I think someone like a Cottle Malone is going to have to, you know, chip in with that three or four points that he had been chipping in with in games last year and that he's been even doing this year as well. Uh, on Kelly, I think Kelly needs a 113 or a 114 for Clare to be winning this game, I think, realistically. What you said about Shannon is really interesting. If I'm a defender and the ball is coming down on top of me like this, you know, I'm happy enough. If I'm mm. a defender and all of a sudden the ball is coming into Shannon and it's coming on a diagonal and there's potential for him to catch and turn all in one movement... Like it's it's all about the quality of ball that's going inside. It'd be interesting to see. I think I do think Kelly will play inside, even if it's briefly, and then he'll he'll try and pose several different questions for the Waterford defence. And he's gonna have to, you know, he's gonna have to be up there with an eight or a nine out of ten, I think, for for Claire to be winning this game. Um interesting that we're talking about matchups then as well. Like Desi Hutchinson, I remember I text JJ Delaney after the game last year. He was he was doing man of the match for Sky Sports and ridiculously he didn't give it to Desi Hutchinson who scored 2-2. Two, two. I had a fiver on him, 12 to 1. I text I should have texted him before he was making the decision and tried to buy him off or something. But who picks up him? Like because he's coming in in serious form. One three, one three again, or sorry, two two against Tip. He hit one three against Galway. Like does Rory Hayes pick him up? Who did, you know, well at times last year. But there was an awful lot of space. A lot of the time, it was one-on-one -on -one ball inside. That's what begs the question to me. Like, with, with Colm Galvin, not particularly in form, and with not a huge amount of time under his belt, you know, is there a potential for him to drop back as a seventh defender and try and protect that forward line, try and protect the threat of the Bennets? Uh, or maybe 
he'll pick up maybe this, maybe he'll pick up the center forward and John Conlon would slip back. There's a lot of questions there as well, you know. Yeah, I mean John Conlon obviously played very well the last day against Kilkenny and Clare put up a scoreline of 420. Actually, if you just consider the two teams here, Clare and Watford, they're coming into this game after wins over Kilkenny and Tipperary respectively, and that's not always going to be the case over the years or certainly hasn't been the case over the years just another point also is we've spent an awful lot of time here talking about tony kelly former hurler of the year but we've barely even mentioned austin gleason and the role that he'll play in this game which probably highlights how crucial each player is to each team like austin gleason can be one of these guys who sticks the knife into the opposition and is the reason that you that you might win but the team, I feel, can be competitive even if he doesn't necessarily shoot the lights out. Would you go along with that? Yeah, no, I would. I would go along with that. Yeah, um, I, I think like Kelly has to be at a high level for Clare to win. Gleeson doesn't necessarily have to be at a massively high level for. Like I put it this way, the beat Cork pulling up last year, Gleeson hit three points in the second half with ten minutes to go. Had flashes of brilliance. Uh, but you know, didn't dominate the game as he would like. Then, obviously, and you look at the All Ireland semi final last year, and you're thinking, when you, as you say, when Waterford were just had the foot in Kilkenny's throat, Gleason tipped them over the edge. And that's what he can do as well. But it's just going to be interesting to see like, does he play centre back? Does he play wing back? Does he play back in the forward line? Um, it's going to be in interesting field? to see where they play. It's, I mean, yeah. with, with Jamie yeah. Barron out, does he go in there with Darrell Lines, who's been a very impressive player this year, hasn't he? Yeah, no, he has. He's been very good. Loads of energy. And like I think Fastly becoming one of the best players for Waterford and one of Waterford's most important players is Jack Prendergast. And I think his role is really interesting, uh, particularly if he plays centre forward. You've mentioned how, you know, Dottie Burke, Dottie Burke wasn't necessarily always picking him up in the Galway game, but he ended up at 1-2. Uh, I think I think th I think Waterford will go after John Conlon a bit. Uh, he's not an experienced centre back at county level. He's not. He hasn't played championship games centre back for Clare. So I do think Waterford will go after him. And Prendergast is the exact sort of player that can find these pockets of space that can take him on and put him on the back foot. So that's going to be really interesting as well. Uh, I just think yeah, there's so many different areas for both teams to be targeting and for both teams to be really wary of as well. And you're looking at a Waterford team that conceded seven goals in their last two games, conceded five against Cork. That's 12 in three games. And you're looking at a Clare team and you're thinking you're potentially trying to pick holes at their centre-back and other areas. Uh, Dermot Ryan was brilliant during the league, but he's not an experienced wing-back in Championship Hurling. You know, so both teams will fancy their chances of putting up big scores. Yeah, and mentioning Desi Hutchinson again, we'd have to we'd have to point out that Aaron Fitzgerald, he's out of this game as well. Pat O'Connor, who's obviously been a captain, you know, that he's out. He might be the next up for that role if Rory Hayes wasn't going to pick him up. So there's definitely issues at the back there for Clare, no doubt about it. Um Paddy Fitz Fitzpatrick, who must be six foot six or six foot seven, yeah. he played against Dublin there recently. Uh, let me just double check and see if he played against Kilkenny the last day. I'm not sure that he did. Uh, he did he come on in that game? No, it doesn't. Doesn't even look like he came on in that game. I wonder, like, is he part of uh, what Brian Lowen is doing, which is transitioning this team from what was always small, little, nippy, fast hurlers into like a big team now with John Conlon there. Like Dermot Ryan is obviously young, and maybe he'll fill out a little bit more. But he's not a small player. Aidan McCarthy's very well filled out. Cahill Malone's a big man. Uh, David Fitzgerald, who has been carrying a knock. Like he's another big man. Shanahan's a big man. Connor Cleary is obviously yeah. arguably the biggest of the lot. So he's he's certainly trying to find that balance because in the past there was probably too many little fellas, if you want, who could all hurl. You know, they they always could hurl, but maybe just not enough to be able to mix it up. There was uh, there was definitely something else I wanted to point to there. Yeah, Lohan did talk about the injuries in Shane O'Donnell. He goes, Shane is out. He's gone for the weekend. He got a concussion before the Kilkenny game. So obviously we have to abide by the return to play protocols. And he's not ready to come back. So that's it. Concussion is obviously a very serious matter. And we abide by those rules. Aaron Fitzgerald is also out. He got a bad belt in the game against Kilkenny and hasn't recovered. So we'll have to plan without him as well. David McInerney came off injured in the first half of the Kilkenny game, but we haven't made a decision on him yet for the weekend. We're hoping he'll be fit to play. Uh, these are two managers that took over sides that were drifting a little bit, I suppose you could you could say. And it really feels like both Lohan and Liam Cal have the have the people of, the, of both counties behind them, doesn't it? 
Oh, they definitely do. Um, like I would say both exceeded expectations last year. Clare's expectations were very low going into the championship. All of a sudden, they went on a bit of a run. Uh, obviously, ended by Waterford. Uh, Waterford were on the floor, I would say, when Cattle came in after a disaster 2019. Got to a Munster final, acquitted themselves well. Big performance against Clare. You know, one of the great Waterford performances against Kilkenny as well. And we're far from disgrace in the All-Ireland final when Limerick just really showed up and hit a different gear. Uh, so, like, both of those are hoping to kick on. Only one can win Sunday. But it's a massive opportunity for either. Like, I, I do think I do think if, if Waterford can get over Clare at the weekend, get Prunty and potentially get Barron back, even though I think his injury potentially could be a bit more serious than just missing this weekend, that he could miss the weekend after as well. I do think Watford are well-placed to give Tip a right rattle in the semi-final, but they have to get over the weekend first. Yeah, and you, could, you couldn't guarantee that it isn't going to be clear either. But it, look, going through that Watford team, are they going to be able to expose whatever kind of frailties we might see in that backline for Watford? So Conor Cleary, if he ends up, it, it probably won't happen now, but if he does end up isolated on a pacey man, whether it's Shane Bennett or whether it's uh, Desi Hutchinson. Now, I, I'm sure they'll go with the matchups and Claire whole, Claire's whole plan is to make sure that that doesn't happen. But whether it's pace in there or players who can carry the ball straight up through the centre, and I'll just kind of list out a few of them, even just referencing the, the win over Tipperary recently. Caelan Lyons can obviously burn through a team. Uh, Kieran Bennett can come on. He can do it. Austin Gleeson can. Dara Lyons it seems his first instinct is to try and turn and either beat a man or commit a man. Um, Peter Hogan can, Jack Fagan can, Stephen Bennett will obviously run it all day, Desi Hutchinson, Shane Bennett, Jack Prendergast would probably be out in the half forward line. Are Clare going to be able to deal with that? Some I, I energy. It's yeah. some energy, isn't it? It is some energy. And I think, yeah, I, I'm not sure if they will be able to deal with that. Obviously, um, it's not they're not playing in Parky Cueve like they were last year, which is has to be, you know, as big, if not bigger than Crow Park. Massive, massive dimensions. As big as Turles is, probably not probably not as big as, as Parky Cueve. There seems to be more space in Parky Cueve. Uh but or does I, I'm it not feel sure. like it is because it's a massive bowl. And that can actually affect yeah. your mentality out there, to be fair. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Um, I'm just not sure if, if I'm not sure if Clare would be able to you know, match that type of pace, particularly for 70 minutes. They do have, Watford do have guys that can come in and make that similar kind of impact. Mikey kiley has been coming on. Patrick, sure. Curran, came, Patrick Bur uh, Curran came on against Limerick and turned the game with three points. Like, I think Watford have a panel now. I'm not so sure if they had a panel last year. I think they have a panel now. And even if a couple of guys are missing, even if they're missing the likes of Prunty and Barron, I do think they have replacements maybe that didn't have last year. And I have to, like, maybe I'm... I'm uh, I'm kind of going a bit early, but I too think Liam Cattle has done a serious job in Waterford already and just developed a squad now that I think can be uh, as competitive with anyone there. But I, I do think it's going to be a better of a game. I think it'd be very, very tight, but I do think Waterford will just have a bit too much. Yeah, and if, you, if someone was to tell you that you'd still be tipping Waterford to win this game, even though they wouldn't have, they may not, or certainly have an injury doubt over their fullback. Uh, Connor Prunty, that tight Borka wouldn't be playing, that Park Mahoney wouldn't be available. You know, and there's probably one or two other lads that we've kind of mentioned that are injury doubts. You'd be thinking, yeah, that's going to be a tough job to be favourites in this game, but so it is. Joe Butler says, all your comments are relevant, uh, relevant and are a factor, but at the end of the day, most games are won on attitude, desire, confidence and belief. It's a given that all inter-county players have skill and some counties won. Have all those risky hurdles. <laughs> Good man, Joe. Good man, so yeah, I think done. I think we know exactly what he's referencing. So anyone who missed the shows in the last couple of weeks, that's obviously a little sideswipe at the way that I back the Tipperary hurlers, perhaps being too skillful for their own good. But uh, like I think that is a prerequisite. Obviously, you need desire all over the field if you're going to compete. Um, so when we start talking about other things, matchups and all that kind of stuff, it's almost like a given that the work rate has to be there and, and that you're willing to die for that ball. Well, if there's something, if, if they're not, you know, if, if the attitude isn't right for a championship game, like, then, like all the league games were preparation for this. Like if the attitude and the focus and the concentration isn't right, there's, some, there's something seriously wrong. Like why, like, you know, and why are you doing it if you're not ready for this game? I kind of don't get the, I know it's easy to get, you know, potentially get complacent at different times, but like, this is the only game that really matters. Forget about tipping the league or Galway in the league. Or, like, this is all that matters. A win sets up potential Munster semi-final with, with Tipperary and then you're one step away from being in a Munster final. Like, this is all that matters. Like, forget about league games or anything like that. So you do just take that as a prerequisite. You have to. 
Yeah, and how much is the weather going to play uh, an impact in this? I mean, I'm just looking at the um, at Sunday's forecast, looking at around 18 degrees, something like that. You, you, you've you had an injury recently, wouldn't be like you, so you've missed a nice bit of training, but you're back doing a bit now. Are you, are you finding it tough out there? Like, one thing that really stands out to me through training the last month or so is just the pitches are like a car park. Oh, now, I don't, I don't it, expect yeah. Semple Stadium to be quite like that. But it's tough going on the body. There could be injuries, lads slowing da down, lads puffing. And this will be an extra step up now in intensity from the league. There'll be nothing left in the dressing room this time. So that, that might leave a little bit of room for the unexpected to happen. The minute you start talking about weather, I just got a picture of you like dressed up as Evelyn Cusack or something, doing some sort of RT weather report or something like that. But uh, it's tough. Jesus, Shane, it's tough going. That gr the ground is rock hard. I don't think there's any... Like, I don't think there's any coincidence that just look at the age profiles of the teams. Like, they're down in their mid 20s. They're guys that can take all this training, that can take, you know, uh, a 75 minute game this week and go and play another game. Uh, and that's the way it's going now. Like, it's just, it's so tough on the body. Like, Liam Cattle talked about the age profile of his squad. Like, outside of Kevin Moore, they're all prime ages. Same with, same with Claire, basically. Like, show me one Claire guy that. Like is likely to be retiring in the next three or four years. I don't. I don't think there really is one. They're all prime age profiles. John Conlon, uh, maybe. John Conlon, maybe. Yeah, outside, outside, outside of him. But uh, conditions should be absolutely perfect. It's as I said, it's prime conditions for Championship hurling. It's not the Winter Championship that we played last year, even though we got great games uh, in spite of the weather and in spite of the conditions. It's going to be attritional. It will come down to depth of squads, and I think despite the players that they're missing, I do think Waterford have a bit more and have a bit more depth, have a bit more uh, proven quality of, on the bench of guys that can deliver in championship games. Yeah, to be fair, actually, we probably, when we were talking about the fullback line for Clare, we probably should have mentioned the likes of Jack Brown and Paul Flanagan, who's been used a nice bit recently. Maybe they'll come into the reckoning here. Uh, yeah, Jack, another... Brown, Jack Brown played Clare Cup, I think, last week for Ballier, which is, uh, which would, I don't know, which would suggest maybe that He's not uh, indirect and as much as he had been. Like he uh, was, you know, ha really harshly denied an All Star nomination in 2018 when I thought he should have been getting an All Star nearly. And he seems to he was in around the team last year, but just doesn't seem to be in the equation as much this year. Do you know what's a really interesting point that I saw uh, journalist Joe Callahan make the other day when he was talking about the Euros? He uh, he was looking at all the captains and uh, the the age profile. A third of the captains in the Euros are over the age of 35. Isn't that quite crazy? Yeah, it's. I suppose it's, it's a, a lot of the time it's experience, isn't it? More, nearly more than anything else. John Connell is 31, I think, for Clare. Uh, the Waterford captain is actually the, the opposite side. Prunty's only early 20s, but it, mm. is, an, it is an interesting one. Seamus Callan is uh, 32 or 33, I'd say. Kilkenny have gone the opposite way. Adrian Mullen is like 21. But it's interesting. Usually, it's an experienced person, an experienced player, where you know what you're going to get out of them on a given day. Yeah, and I think maybe something to do with like international football, when teams only meet ever every so often, they have a few windows a year, and they meet up, and it's not like the manager can sit there and work out the the team shape and systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, every day like they do at club level. But with international level, then they obviously need someone who can guide the team through it, even though in general. A 25 year old or a 22 year old is going to have far more energy in the tank than a 35 plus year old so in some situations the international team is looking for someone who's a leader who's been there done it and delivered and is sort of a, a guiding voice in the dressing room whereas with inter-county and ga in general it's it's always felt like the push has been we need energy we need you to get the old out get the new in and also obviously then there's the whole commitments that people have in real life once they hit mid 20s onwards or late 20s onwards so they naturally sort of filter away yeah i i always think uh within the ga the the youth versus experience thing is an interesting one and you can, to me like you can have all the speed and all the energy you want but in the last 15 minutes of a championship game it's usually the leaders that stand up and a lot of time those leaders are more experienced players or you need somebody who's got that know-how to you know I'm not being cynical or anything, but take a lad down when he needs to be taken down or slow the game down or do something that's going to change momentum. Uh, so, like, energy is one thing, but I think experience... Uh, like, it's so easy to look at. I always think it's gas, particularly at club level. It's so easy to look at this 
pacey player and what he can bring to the table. But at the end of the day, like, is he going to upend the lad when he needs to be upended? Is he going to, you know, change the momentum of the game or do something really inspirational? I always think a lot of the time the experienced players come to the fore when something like that needs to happen. So it's kind of a balance of the two. Like, wouldn't we all love to have that pace of it? someone in their early 20s? But I think when you get older, you learn that, OK, if I can get a big catch here or something or win a free or something to turn the game, like that can be as important as having pace. Yeah, I mean, look at Michael Brick Walsh. If you were to just go on, you know, when he's in his mid th mid thirties, like thirty four and thirty five and thirty six, and playing in All Ireland semi finals and there thereabouts in the championship at Watford, even though they've lots of pace in the in the panel and these guys coming through from All Ireland under twenty one and minor winning teams, you'd be thinking just by attributes alone, speed and and skill and stuff like that. Well, there shouldn't really be a place for somebody like that in there. But of course, as you and I have talked about ad nauseum. There always was a place for him. He was crucial. He was a ball winner. He might expose a mismatch in terms of height, as we saw at Mark Coleman in the All Ireland semi final 2017. But who else are, who are those other experienced players out there that are really still uh, to the fore? I mean, Seamus Callanan, obviously, TJ Reid, Patrick, Patrick Horgan, Horgan, Joe yeah. Canning, Parik uh, Kevin, Marr, Kevin Noel Kevin. McGrath. <laughs> are, are we basically listing some of the best players, like. Maybe five of those were in our top ten hurlers. That the experience is still absolutely massive if you, if you can get the best out of them. And people, get your comments in and let us know who are the best experienced players out there that are thirty and plus. One hundred percent, Jen. I don't think you can beat that experience. Now, there's a time when if you go to like sometimes if you go to thirty five or thirty six, your body has just slowed down to the extent that your experience just doesn't count as much. You can't be in those areas that you need to be in. But I still think that's really interesting. We played a game, a club game last year with Burr. I won't say who we were playing or who the player was involved, but we were under pressure after half time. And uh, all of a sudden, one of, one of our more experienced players just got in the face of one of their more experienced players. And it, it just it, it totally turned the game on its head, completely. It just totally turned the game. It, the tempo changed completely. And all of a sudden, you know, our... Uh, quicker flying kind of players were able to just get on the ball more. It just changed the whole nature of the game. And I don't think a younger player would do something would do something like that or would have the, the know-how to do something like that. And I just think it's sometimes we can be like we can be so quick to retire fellas and oh he Asher, we've loads of young lads coming through. He should go back her an intermediate. And I, I just I don't I, I don't buy it. I think in the cut and trust of championship hurling there's marrying that blend of youth and experience. And when you need lads to step up at crucial times, invariably it is the TJ Reid, the Seamus Callan, the Noel McGrath. Uh, like I'm not saying they can't do it the whole time. Their bodies probably won't allow it. But a lot of time it's those more experienced players that are stepping up. Yeah, I mean, look at the rush to retire Kevin Moore and just because Kevin, our Garrod Hegarty, got away from him in a couple of runs in the 2019 Monster Championship game when it was a huge scoreline for Limerick and Waterford scored 10 points. Then the following season, Kevin Moore is a key part of that Waterford team that gets to the All Ireland final. Fine, the final didn't the final didn't go his way, but he still gave a, an excellent performance along the way. But that's a good point you make about what will an experienced player take on the field from the opposition? Because in Championship, there's no room for taking a backward step. That if someone gets in your face as a younger player, you might take it a little bit more than, than an older player would. And like, there's a funny one during the week, even at training. Uh, I don't know if you ever play a possession game and, you know, you, you're obviously trying to stop guys uh, getting past you or whatever. So I, I, I put the arm out with the, you know, on the hurley side. And you often see players doing this where when they're trying to get past you, they sort of chop your hurley with their hurley as they're going past to sort of knock it out of your way. Do you, do you know that whole yeah, thing? Yeah, exactly. Often yeah, see yeah. defenders, they hit your hurley as they're going past. So this lad, and he knows who he is and he's probably watching, he chopped down, but he clipped the edge of my thumb while he did it. So obviously I just flaked him straight away and we had a bit of a roaring match, getting a little bit upset at each other and laughing about it afterwards because we pretty much have one big row every year. So that's that out of the way. But that, it's crucial to set a tone like that. He'll think twice about chopping me again when he's coming out. And I'll think twice about putting my arm out again. So you kind of there's these little battles going on and you can't, no one can afford to take a backward step. 100%. And I always think... Like, 
I'm coming to, towards the end with Borra, but you're always thinking any games. That Will we you play. go air that? Yeah, but sometimes I just run into some of the young lads. I ran into a young lad just last night, just because like we're playing a possession game, and sometimes everyone's can be a bit nice. So you sometimes just run into a lad or drag him to the ground or something like that, and it can kind of, but can kind of just set a bit of an intensity, and then they realise, and then all of a sudden they're. Uh, they're kind of a bit ruffled and then they're kind of shoving you out of the way and you're basically, I think, uh, replicating what's going to happen in a championship game. Sometimes we can be all too nice. It's not like it's championship hurling is not nice. It's bitter, miserable hurling. You have to be, you have to be absolutely on point. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes to win. But no, I definitely think experience is absolutely crucial. And I think it's very short-sighted to think any different. And to yeah. be retiring guys before they need to be retired. Without question. So Colm O'Donnell comes in. If Watford beat Clare, and I think they will, then they could, uh, they could well beat Tip. But Clare wouldn't beat Tip. Watford have serious goal threats this year and Tip a bit slow on defence. So I think there's probably plenty of people out there who feel that. Now, if we're going to come to it, do you expect Watford to win this game? I do, no. I, I do, in fairness. And I agree with that viewer there. Um... I, while, while I think Clare will be very, very competitive, I think it'll be a very good game. I think for the competitiveness of the championship, a Waterford win would be better because I do think I, I do think if a, a fairly full strength Waterford would give Tip lots of it, I think they could potentially beat them. Uh, so no, I do think Waterford will get the job done. Um, I think they'll get the job done by four or five in the wind up, but I think it'd be a better of a game and a right high scoring game. They might just pull away at the very end. Yeah, it's the scoring threats here. Are yeah. there enough scoring threats on the clear side of it? Yeah, Tony Kelly, he is. Aaron Shannon has shown that there's a goal in him. Would probably like to add a few more points. I think Aidan McCarthy, if they feed enough balls short to him, right, I'd create a, a conundrum for whoever is centre-back. Obviously, the teams haven't been named at this point. We could speculate all the names, but we know who the candidates are. If they feed enough balls short and Aidan McCarthy is there or a wing forward and they get the ball to him. Now, this really frustrated me when I was watching Clare against Kilkenny that... It's pretty evident that Tony Kelly and Aidan McCarthy are the two main men that you want. You want to put the ball in their hands. Obviously, there's a few others, but primarily get it into their hands at least 15 times throughout the game. And they weren't doing it. But like when Kelly got the ball, you know, obviously Kilkenny were dust at the other end of the field. Kelly ended up with two five, one five of those from from placed balls. But that kind of highlights the point. They didn't get it into his hand enough so he could do the damage. Now, Aidan McCarthy did get three, but I think he's the sort of player that has five or six points from play in him. So if Clare can do that, get the ball into their hands time after time, i give him a real chance here. But I think there's too many scoring threats at the other end. Stephen Bennett, he's probably going to pop up with three or four from play and knock over ten frees. Desi Hutchinson with decent delivery. And they're doing a nice crossfield ball for him, and you can. F it feels like his touch is getting even better now again in the second season. If if Desi plays well, Waterford won't be beaten. I'll put well, it that, that way. That gives you a fair indication that good yeah. early ball is going in if they do that, yeah. and because they run the ball up the centre, and the likes of John Connan is going to go, have to come and try and meet that threat eventually. If if Waterford have, have previously been scoring from out the field, then that's going to open up the the lines for the ball to be knocked in inside, and then their issues really begin. Like Austin Gleeson, I don't know where he's going to play. I honestly don't. I still think he should be in the forward line somewhere, but he's so good. He's a, he genuinely is a victim of his own success. I mean, how many players could you throw in full forward out of nowhere last year and they end up in, look, we, we won't argue the toss on it, but in all-star type form anyway, at a very, very minimum. And then he's so good, they pull him out of position and expect him to just hit the ground running somewhere else. And now maybe they'll move him around again. And then people will criticise him for not being 10 out of 10 every day. Well, if your position is swapped all the time, it's very difficult. And it just shows the level of class he has that you can take him out of a position, throw him in full forward, and he ends up playing that good. So we're able to talk through an awful lot of top players here in this Watford team. And it feels like any one of them, you know, Shane Bennett, Stephen Bennett, Ozzy Gleeson, Caelan Lyons, could all be man of the match. And there's fewer lads on the clear side. So people get your comments in. Let us know if you agree or not. Uh, Lisa S. Videos says, Watford win on Sunday by at least five points. I'd say it'll be a good game. There'll be at least two goals from Watford. So uh, I think it'll be something similar to last year's championship game. I think it'll be that sort of uh, 324 to you know, 221 or something along those lines. I think it'll be a real high scoring game. Lots of goals, lots of action. But I, uh, yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be strong on Watford. 
Yeah, and I can't wait to go to that game. I'm going to be inside in the good field in Thurless. Uh, just a reminder, we're brought to you by the bamboo stick from Torp. If you want to get extra distance down the field, great Hurley, I'm using it there myself at the moment. Uh, go to the, the link to where you can buy that is in the description of the video and use the promo code our game and you'll get 10% off. Also, if you want to get the audio podcast that is show, the only place you can get it is at patreon.com forward slash our game. Five euros per month to uh, get five exclusive bob. Content. Five bob, you could not go wrong. You couldn't bait it with a stick, could you, Michael Burns? It's Bernie? the same price as a hurling grip, basically, to, to listen to the, us two apes talking <laughs> and get all the all the all the other content for five quid a month. You couldn't go wrong. We'll move into Leinster this weekend. It's definitely not as high profile as Watford Clare, no doubt about that, but it obviously means everything to Dublin and Antrim and then also in the other game, Leash against Wexford, all of their fans. Uh, bad news for Matty Kenny with Eamon Trollier Dillon being out for the season because he's He's been an important player, especially like you go back to last year when they were falling apart against Kilkenny. Both himself and Ronan Hayes came in and turned the game. And the pace of Trollier, like, uh, and I've played against him at club level, like he is a lightning player with scores in him. So that is a bit of a blow. Oh, definitely. Uh, like even sometimes he, he's not best when starting games, actually. He's brilliant coming into a game just because he's so kind of dynamic. But he's out. Uh, it was interesting, Matty Kenny's quotes on uh, FM 104. I, I still don't know the, na the nature of the injury because he didn't say things are so co covert now. He didn't actually say the injury, but he just said, I'm really disappointed with Trollier himself. He got himself, as he does every year, in great condition. He worked so hard in a difficult period there with the pandemic and COVID. He came back and was going really well, really well. But unfortunately, he picked up this injury. It's going to rule him out for this year's inter county championship. I think it's gas. Like it's like it's like the rugby or something now that they're like you can talk about how much of a loss he's going to be, but don't tell us what type the what type of injury he has. But he's going to be a big loss because Shane, what have we talked about uh, with regards to Dublin? They're not blessed with a load of like real killer attackers. He is the sort of guy that can come in and hit three or four or get a goal. He like he's always good for a goal in around there. So that's like it's probably putting more pressure on the likes of Ron and Hayes and Donald Burke up front. It it is a big loss. Yeah, and you know people are so quick to look for the negatives in Dublin, but you know obviously some brilliant news last night with winning the delayed 2020 Leinster Under 20 Championship, beating Galway in the final. Uh, Lee Gannon, uh, a very good player from Whitehall, Colm Kill, uh, he scored four points and got man of the match. And he was only drafted in a couple of weeks ago. He was with the Dublin under-20 footballers that got to the All-Ireland final last year and lost to Galway, as it happened. Lee Murphy, my own club mate, he scored seven points. Michael Murphy scored a couple. Dara McBride scored two. Dara Purcell scored four. So that's a big boost. I mean, you know, you can't... Like, Leinster titles don't fall out of trees. And to beat Galway, Galway always have good hurlers coming through. So it's nice to not ha always have to talk about, oh, Dublin don't have players coming. You know, Dublin don't have this, don't have the other. They're after getting a Leinster under-20 title, and that's a, a boost they needed. They have plenty of players coming, Shane, but it's, it's the likes of Lee Gannon. Like, we, he probably will not be talking out for the Dublin senior hurlers. He's probably more likely to be involved with the Dublin senior footballers over the next couple of years. Well, that's if he has the patience to wait a few years because he's definitely not going to wall straight in. I remember watching him in the under-20 football final last year and I was pulling my hair out at times because he was trying so many things that were sort of like low percentage kind of cross-field kicks or whatever it was. I re just remember, without knowing the specifics of what it was, I was thinking at times... Right, the Dublin footballers aren't going to love you doing that. They're going to try and beat that out of you. But he's a really good hurler. I remember we played a league game against Whitehall there. I think it was the summer of 2019, late 2019. And uh, he scored six points from play from centre forward. And I, was, I remember thinking, geez, there's plenty of hurling in this lad. Now, he's obviously not going to be involved this weekend, but it just comes back to a good week for Dublin hurling. Yeah, I, I didn't see much of that game last night, to be honest with you. I only saw a few highlights on Twitter, but I saw Dublin beating awfully in the semi-final and they were very impressive. I think it was could have been a quarter-final, actually, but they were very impressive. It was on down in Burr, uh, really good side. Uh, I think Paul O'Brien is over there, who was a good operator, was involved with DCU there a few years ago as well. Um, like that, that's that's good sign that they've plenty of, that they've a good uh, conveyor belt coming through. Humphrey Keller had been saying to me, former Dublin boss, that they've no problem developing players as minors and twenties. It's making that step up, and it's the potential of losing some of those best players to the senior footballers. And you say if he's if he has the you know if the likes of Lee Gannon have the patience to wait. I think the the knowledge that if you wait, you have a great chance of winning All Ireland's, like a really really realistic chance of winning All Ireland's, is a, is a nice carrot there for you. 
Um, like I saw Galway beating Kilkenny in the, I think it was the semi final as well in Port Leash one night. Galway were really impressive, so that's a fair statement uh, from that Dublin side. In fairness to them, uh, I don't like. I don't think there'd be any of those players involved this weekend. But if you look at it, like Dublin win a Leinster under twenty title, this game this weekend for the seniors is huge because you know if they if they're beaten, they're potentially another defeat away from being in the Joe McDonough Cup, which would be. You know, it would have been unfathomable five or six years ago to think that. And while they are strong favourites for the for the game against Antrim this weekend, there's a fair bit of there's a nice bit of pressure that comes with it. Uh, and the, the trapdoor of potentially going down to the Joe McDonough would be disastrous for Dublin. So I think any motivation, if there was any you know need for motivation, they have it now. You know, they have the people are kind of as we say. The commentary maybe around Dublin hurling isn't uh, particularly positive, and you ask like, why are we always talking negatively maybe about Dublin hurling? Because like since that Galway game two years ago, has there been much to be that positive about? I'm not. I'm not sure if if there has been. Been honest with you, but just a huge game for them this weekend, and just have to get a result. You, the difference of one point. You know, last year after coming from 16 points behind to get level with uh, Kilkenny, and then obviously Hugh Law was it Hugh Lawler scored the winner yeah. uh, late on. If they had to actually complete that turnaround, that's that's how difficult it is. Once you actually get level, you probably kind of exhale for a second, and then the other team gets going again. Um, but if they had to manage to to go through and get that victory, God knows the confidence that that would have brought. Just looking at the betting, even Dublin are two to nine here, Antrim are four to one. So all this talk, and it feels like the country is looking for Antrim to get the win. And I can understand why, if you're talking about the improvement that Antrim have made and you want to see them kick on to the next level uh, or whatever it might be. But I kind of feel like there's a little bit of badness towards Dublin here that, uh, I don't know, does it, is it transported across from the football where everyone is sick of the Dublin footballers winning? So any excuses or any way that you can see Dublin going poorly in any old code will do. Uh, I'm not so, I'm not so sure. Like they, ha they haven't exactly been um, pulling up trees this year in particular and they didn't really last year either. Um, so I, I'm not sure if it's like looking for negativity. It's just I think I think most people are looking for more teams to be really, really competitive at the top table. And I think there was a great hope that Dub uh, after 2013 that Dublin would kick on. And outside of a result here or there and that Galway defeat in in 2019, we haven't really got that. And like they're they're down towards we did the power rankings last week, and there wasn't too much debate. They were going to be you know nine or ten realistically. And I think there was potential that they could have been up around three, four. Oh, we're after losing Michael Verney there, so uh, he'll come back in a second. I'd say somebody, his mammy must be trying to ring him. But uh, I'll just bring up a couple of the comments here uh, just while he's gone for the second. <clears throat> Any chance, uh, says Joe Butler, of the two apes leading the charge to get rid of the water break? Uh, you do well going for over an hour at times and not a drop of water to be seen. Um, I will say when you're playing a match, and I'm sure many people would agree that it is brilliant to know that that break is coming. So if there's a ball coming and, you know, there's... 14 minutes gone in a game, you know you can leave Everton on the sideline and sort of, uh, or leave Everton out there and make sure that you're okay in a minute or two's time because you know you've that water break coming. Just a comment coming in from Joe Butler there about getting rid of the, the water break. I think in terms of the spectacle, us watching Intercounty or even us watching games, I would want to get rid of it. But certainly as a player, it's great to know that it's coming. Yeah, I love, I like the water break from a player, I have to say, because it uh, particularly as an older player, you know, when you're almost hanging for, you know, a break or hanging for just get to half time now and get a bit of a break and get going again. It, it's nice to be able to split it into four quarters from a player's point of view, from, uh, you know, from a punter's point of view or a spectator's point of view. Uh, you just prefer the flow. It does. It changes the game yeah. invariably. It does change I think it has the game to go. an awful lot. I, yeah. I think so too. Like what's the... Like, what's the need going to be? Like, after this after this year, like, there's going to be no need for a water break. Uh, like, as I said, managers and players will want them. Um, but, but, like, I just think it does. I think it interrupts the flow of the game too much. And I, do, I just don't... Like, after this year, there should not be any need for it. You should be able to... You should be able to get back in with... Uh, Mayor Ishkis should be able to get back in with water. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I, don't think it, uh, I don't think it should be kept. It's going to be a tough job on the line for managers now, especially with, you know, crowds coming back in and... Obviously, it's absolutely ridiculous that only 200 people can get into a 50,000-seater stadium in Semple Stadium over the weekend, as one example. But it's a tough job for managers at the moment when you don't have the Mayor Ferna. Now, I spoke with James Horn, 
the Mayo manager, and uh, there's a clip up on the YouTube channel there at the moment if you want to check it out. But uh, that and that was more so about their injury situation. But he was talking about how difficult it is to not have the mirror Ferna on the sideline, so that the water breaks become even more important because trying to get a message out there when you don't have runners is unbelievably difficult. So that's going to be the case for all of these teams, and they all feel like tactics are key and they need to get their messages out there. I just getting rid of the mayor Forna, like Janie Mack, like was there is there been a load of flashpoints outside of the Greg Kennedy incident? No, there hasn't. Just like make the make the rules a bit more stringent for what they can and can't do. And now because we've gotten rid of the mayor Forna, it almost it almost makes the water break acceptable. It's ridiculous. The the the, the mayor Forna to me, like I like seeing Paul Kinnerk on the sideline beside Kylie, like one of the great minds. I like seeing, you know, The Rock beside Kieran Kingston, Martin Comerford or uh, James McGarry or whoever it is beside Cody, Mikey Beavens beside Liam Cat. Like, I like seeing that. It adds more characters to the game. It makes it more interesting. And now all, all of a sudden the water break is now acceptable because we've gotten rid of the Mayor Forna. Like, fair enough, there was some of the fo in the football lads were absolutely taking the piss with it because they were standing in space that they should never have been standing in duty. Like just just hit them with a ban. Say, okay, you're banned for the rest of the year. You're not allowed to do that. Just say you're not allowed on the field. You're not allowed on the field to play at certain times. Just make the rules a bit more clear cut rather than or oh, send them up into the stand, punish everybody. Like I like I like seeing those characters uh, involved in the game. It's more personalities. It makes uh, I think it makes the game more interesting. Just define what they're allowed to do a bit better a bit clearer i'm after getting a text and also uh, a message on youtube there saying what about five points for a goal and this is something that i saw in an article written by nikki english about a week ago now, i didn't get a chance to go through the article i just saw the, the pull quote i would be i couldn't be more against the idea of five points for a goal and people get your comments in and let us know what you think the reason being is that if I'm a team and I'm worried about conceding a goal and I know I've got the weaker hand as a manager, I'm already leaving a sweeper back at three points. If it then becomes five points for a goal, well, if the other team gets one goal or two goals, that is pretty much game over for me. So I'm going to bring even more lads back and I'll probably just play with one up front and maybe he mightn't even be up at the square. You're, it's going to become, it's going to encourage teams to sit back even more. So as far as I'm concerned, that will lead to even more running of the ball through the hands, down the wings, points from probably the sideline, free-taking competitions will be enhanced even more. Let's just let the game evolve. Let's stop trying to put, put rules for absolutely everything here. Yeah, I just think, it's again, we're we're very good at overreacting. As I said to you in last week's show, this year's league had the most amount of goals in 10 years. Like, the, the averages went back up to nearly three goals per game. So, like, let's just see if that carries over into championship. And, like, I expect it to carry over into championship. I expect a lot of goals in this year's championship. Particularly from, if you look at, at the likes of Watford, potentially the likes of Eclair, maybe Limerick aren't, you know, uh, big for, big at going for goals. But that means if you can hit Limerick for two or three goals, you have a savage chance of beating them in a championship game. Galway aren't massively big on goals, but a lot of the other tipper tipper Taylor made for goals. You know, so like I, I just think it's a bit of an overreaction. Um, that we're obviously, funnily enough, with that sort of a, an idea, you're going back to the future and going back to you know the way Hurlem was many, many moons ago when a goal was worth you know more than three points. But I just think it's a bit of an overreaction at the moment. Like get get uh, you know get statistical evidence over a good period of time to say like if we're only getting one goal in games and things like this, maybe we need to have a look at. It. Uh, something changing up a small bit, but I definitely think it's a total overreaction at the moment. Yeah, uh, Mike Sinnott says, great show, man, brilliant coverage of Hurling. It's like the sports stadium on a Saturday in the mid-80s with Mick Dunn. The uh, sports stadium I was brought up on that. You'd, you'd see, remember, you'd see like uh, Duxy Walsh be playing handball. It'd be all obscure kind of sports that you get to keep uh, keep watching. I used to love uh, yeah, sports stadium every Saturday. I think the George Hamilton take it over then at one stage as well. Michael Lester did it for a while, I think, too. Mm, I'm too young, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever was going on in the 70s, I'd say you were watching the <laughs> Um I was spoke with Patrick Horgan the other day. The full interview is up there. It's on Patreon and it's on the YouTube channel. And I was just asking him when he felt he kind of knew that he had made it as a, as a car curler. So here's the clip. I just felt um, something as small as um, you know, being given the responsibility of taking frees for, uh, for the team. Like It was a big responsibility for me, obviously. And... Um, as soon as I got that responsibility, I just felt like kind of, you know, not more, not not more pressure on me. But I, I like that. I like that feeling of have, uh, having the, you no, know, having having that on me that you know, I have to strike the freeze. And obviously, 
the way things are going, like you have to be hitting like nine out of ten, ten out of ten to be even uh, level with the opposition because all free takers these days are really good, like you know. For you, was the first day that you were named to take the freeze? Did you feel a pressure going out taking them, even the first one? Uh, not, not, not really, because um, I always find that um, so you could be talking about technique and you could be talking about uh, pressure all day, like, but I honestly thought that I was after practicing so much that like, it wasn't a case of just oh, do what you practice, but I think it was it was more autopilot than anything like your body just is so used to that, uh, those movements of, you know, the pick, the strike that, um, yeah, I, I never felt uh, felt any pressure taking freeze for craft, no. Yeah, because other people would be Probably, tr I presume, like a good free. I mean, I wouldn't be able to 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 understand what it feels like. But when you're in a stadium with fifty thousand, eighty thousand people around you, do you like you go into autopilot or whatever? Can you explain how that even works? Because I think for most other people, they'd be like, "There's eighty thousand people gawking at me here. Never mind what's on TV." Yeah, you know, it's uh, to think about it. No, it is a bit uh, a bit strange and stuff. And is it like you know, you would think, "Oh, yeah, there'd be pressure on there," but. I think like fellas are, are after um practicing so much that like it's nearly it's just automatic like and I like it's all on the day then like of course it's all about how you how you approach it like you know if you're if the first thing in your mind like is when you get a free in the sideline in sixty five, if it's to think about it whether you're behind the chains then so yeah, uh, Patrick Horgan was absolutely brilliant throughout that. And the free-taking this weekend is something that's going to be important in Dublin Antrim. Donald Burke's been pretty much on fire with them throughout the league this year. Whereas, the, I would say that the main reason that Antrim lost to Dublin, and certainly because the, the margin of the defeat, which ended up being eight points, was because their free-taking went to pot during the middle of that game. Now, that, I don't think that was the case in other games, but that's going to be key. And are there other areas that you think are going to be very decisive in this Dublin Antrim game? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's a massive opportunity for Antrim, I think. Uh, like, they probably didn't show enough in that league game against Dublin, but if you look at what they showed in some of the other games, you definitely think that they, you know, they're, as I said to you kind of previously, I think they're on a bit of an upward curve, and Dublin, I don't know if they're on a downward curve, but it's definitely not upward at the moment. I definitely, like, they won the McDonough last year, Antrim did, they won the 2 way. They finished ahead of Dublin in the league, albeit lost to Dublin in that in that kind of game. Uh, they looked very flat that day against Dublin. Didn't look like they had the energy that they had in some other games. But like, the, like when you when you look put down on paper, like the the attacking threats that they have, you know, Keelan Malai, James McNaughton, uh, uh, what, Niall McKenna, Kieran Clark, Connor McCann, Don Nugent in off the bench. Like there's lots of guys that can really, really hurt you on the scoreboard, and it's it's a matter like it's funny you're coming you're looking at a, a really strong probably uh, top top eight for Antrim, and you're looking at that's Dublin's strongest point as well is probably their back eight or back nine. So uh, it's kind of who's going to really win that battle. You're not going to think Dublin are going to kill them on the scoreboard too much, even though they probably will put up a big score. But you know they've no guys that look like they're going to rip Antrim to shreds. So that's good. Yeah, I think it's an interesting game. And I think Darren Gleeson would have had probably one game circled from the start of the year. And with due respect to Dublin, I, I think they would have smelt an opportunity when that draw came out. And it'd be interesting to see what different things they bring to the table that they didn't bring that day against Dublin. Um, have they been keeping a couple of things in their back pocket? Is there anything they learned from that game? Any areas that they can exploit? But uh, that's to me. That's the number two game of the weekend. Like without a doubt, that's like imagine if we're talking Monday about Antrim causing a shock and beating Dublin. Like that would be one of the stories of the season. Yeah, there's going to be some good matchups here. I can see uh, Daryl Gray, who's been scoring lots of points, going and Niall McKenna trying to shut him down. Like McKenna, as we talked about before, he was brilliant in the Joe McDonough run last year. Very good in any game uh, with Antrim this year that I've seen. Scored four points in Parnell Park. Um, I, I'm wondering, is Liam Rush going to be put back into the defence? Is he going to play in the forward line? Will he start at all? Is That's an Sean... interesting one, Shane, yeah. isn't it? Just the second half of that Wexford game. Was it Wexford where he was pushed forward and you're just kind of thinking, Jesus, right, does that put a bit of spanner in the works about what the way they're going to set up for championship or was it just kind of a, a last-ditch kind of a tactic to try and get into the game? Because your centre-back is your centre-back. It's usually... They're playing centre back, and that's only where they're playing, and you know they're going to be playing there. So you just wonder: is is there a few questions about you know is he actually going to be playing there at the weekend, and how secure is he there? 
Yeah, and like if he played full forward, if he's good to go for 60 minutes, 70 minutes, uh, if he's fitting well, at full forward, he is a massive threat. And Jared Walsh, who I'm expecting is going to be against Ronan Hayes, would have his work cut out for him against um, Rush as well. And then what way do they rejig? Does even someone like Owen Campbell go in full back or, or to mark one of those two guys because he's a big man as well? Does Chris Crummy, if Rush has moved up the field, does Chris Crummy go back into the half back line or does he do like he did uh, when I was watching him against Clare? He's wearing number 11, but he's more or less kind of screening his own half back line and himself and Connor Burke are kind of, you know, uh, taking one man up or sweeping depending on where they are on the field or how the opposition is drifting around the place. Uh, is Sean Moran going to be right to play this game? That's another thing. Will Donald Burke play centre forward? How much ball will they get into his hand? Is Mark Schutte going to be right? Danny Suckler's been in form, as in he's getting on ball on the front foot. Again, could probably pass it a little bit more, mix it up a little bit more. He's really, really good player when he's on form. I still think Keen Boland is one of these players that's ready to absolutely catch fire. So there's a there's a... There's a lot of kind of pros and cons to both teams here because neither of them are going to be pushing for an All-Ireland this year. I think it'll make for a very good game. I think it's going to be fire and brimstone, but for me, it's going to be Dublin by two or three. Yeah, uh, I, I, do, I do think Antrim will push them very, very close, but you would have to think that Dublin would have enough to see it out and that bit more know-how at this level to see it out. Uh, Trollier's obviously a loss, uh, but yeah, I just think they'd have a bit much, a bit too much for Antrim. Just to, I think they'll probably not that they'll always have them at arm's length, but I think they'll always be two or three ahead. And as you say, I think they'll probably still be two or three ahead at the finish. Um, but I'd be pleasantly surprised if Antrim were able to, if like if Antrim were able to win, and that means they're s secure in you know Leinster and the All Ireland race for next year again. That'd be huge. And the consequences of this the winning or losing this game for both sides are massive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, MR7, I'm so sick of this constant narrative that Hurling needs to be changed. The only reason people want change is because Hurling has evolved and the owl lads hate to see it. <laughs> there's, a point in that. there's not, there's not, there's a lot to agree in that. Like, it's just like Hurling has changed more than any other sport has changed. And a lot of people just can't get their heads around, you know, possession games. Right? Like, they have to realise it's, it's miles more skillful than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And the level of, of athleticism uh, now compared to years ago is just through the roof. It's just things change. That's, that's just the nature of it. Yeah, you have to go with it. Uh, Mona Lean says, uh, Col at Colm O'Donnell, there were 39 or 89 goals in 30 Division 1 games between 1A and 1B. An average of just under three per game. I don't see the problem. Fair point in that. Uh, Paul Newtape, Lisa's videos is correct. Waterford will win by four to five points. They really do have a strong panel. What's wrong with Jamie Barron? Um, quad, in quad injury for Jamie Barron, which seems to be a, a general team uh, around the country, a lot of quad injuries, a lot of Achilles injuries as well, and calf strains and things like that. Just the nature of it, as I kind of said in one of the other videos, Shane, it's like, you know you're, you know the way league, you're usually playing through the winter and it's heavier ground, you're less likely to you know, be sprinting full out on that heavier ground and you get your legs get time to acclimatise, whereas now their pre-season has been done in hard summer ground and you're just more likely to pick up hamstrings, Achilles and all those types of injuries. Yeah, plenty of comments streaming in, so keep them coming. We love reading them. Uh, Will says, James Skell was saying this morning that he expects it's Davies last year in Wexford and they expect him to see him in the Dublin job this uh, next year. Brian White adds, Matty Kenny's job has to be on the line this year if they don't make big progress. Will no comment in. on that, Shane. No, no, well, no, no I, there's a couple more comments. They're actually all interconnected and we will, we will come back to that. But uh, your sniping is noted. Uh, Will says, we do need to go up a level and David could get us challenging for an All-Ireland, but he is way too much hassle. Also, he peaks in his first two years and then the county has a few years of scorched earth after. Will agreed, but don't want Davy. Wonder if Stapo thinks Davy would be a good fit for Dublin. For me, his teams are just in the papers too much. We don't need that. We need the Dublin football model and adds that Davy would have us like the Dublin footballers 01 to 09, full of hype and attention. I think that would ignore the fact that he is a very good manager. Now, that's not to skip over the point about Matty and that uh, maybe it's his last year. I mean, they probably do need a good result or two to, to, to make that happen. Do you think Davy would even want uh, Dublin? Because there are good players there, but it does feel like there's a ceiling on where this team can go, that they're probably just lacking one or two. And there, there aren't exactly superstars to come in to kind of bring it on to the next level. Now, maybe you could say that about plenty of counties. I think Dublin are still a competitive team most days against most teams. But uh, what do you think? Is there a ceiling on where they can go? 
Um, I think there probably is. I think the fact that they won the twenties last night is, you know, big for the, whoever takes over. Probably not like next year or whoever's manager next year, but in the next three to four years, that there's plenty there to work with. I do think Shane personally. I think it's probably Matty Kenny's last year, unless Dublin get to a Leinster final or get to an All Ireland quarter final or semi final. And I, I, I just don't see, I just don't see that happening. It's his third year, and they've kind of lobbed along. Uh, the first year had. It's, it's gas. The first year had so much potential after that Galway win and you're thinking they have a great chance of getting to an all there should be an All-Ireland quarter final and you would have given them a decent shout against Tip at the time with plenty of momentum behind them but uh, that, all that kind of that bubble has kind of burst a bit since last year was you know they came back against Kilkenny fair enough but they went down very very limply to Cork uh, the league wouldn't exactly blow you away this year and it's not like other years and even under Dalo where you're thinking you know they have an awful lot of players here that could hurt you and they could still produce a big result I'm not sure like outside of outside of probably Leash and Antrim and maybe Wexford who they're going to be beating in championship this year so uh, the, the Davy thing is interesting um, you know if, if history would suggest anything going from Waterford to Clare to Wexford, it would be that like Davy will stay in inter county management if it's even if it's not with Wexford that he would go somewhere else. I think he was was it eleven days after he'd finished up with Clare that he was announced as Wexford manager, something like that. It was a very very short time frame, so I wouldn't be that surprised. And Wexford is a similar one, unless they do something big this year, you would have to say it's his last year uh, because mm-hmm. they had a disappointing twenty twenty, and if twenty twenty one is anything like that, uh, you'd imagine he would finish up then. Well, that point that was made from Mona Lean about uh, 89 goals in 30 games, uh, Colin O'Donnell said, fair point, but stats can be misleading. Let's not forget that Westmead conceded 20 of them. So that is true. There's always a story behind the story. Will uh, adds in, agree, Davy has been good for Wexford, but I think his influence over the team has peaked. Um, Mike Sinnott had in, lads, I reckon Davy has agreed this year and next down here in the Model County. He has loved down around in Escorty and Gorey met as a top team and a dark horse this year. Of course, that shouldn't be overlooked, Shane, as well. Yeah. Like Wexford were on the floor when he came in, and I think people are very quick to. I, I just, of what, what I've seen, I don't think Wexford can compete for an All Ireland this year. But that doesn't get over the fact that some a huge results in 17 get to a Leinster final, huge results in 19 should have been an all Ireland final probably, won a Leinster. Like that's coming from a, a low enough base before that. So I don't think that should be overlooked either. Yeah, and a lot of it too is, do the players want this, the manager to continue? In Wexford, do they? I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of those players that definitely do. In every panel, anyone who's outside the starting 15 or certainly isn't being used as a sub, they're probably sick of the manager and wouldn't mind a change in the hope that the next man will bring them in. And it's the same with Dublin. I mean, there are players that have come through there, like the likes of Andrew Dunphy, has, he's kind of stepped up in the last year or so. So has Dara Gray, so has Donald Burke. Uh, Keen Boland continues uh, his sort of upward trajectory as well. So there might be there might be people inside the Dublin County Board thinking, well, look, maybe another needs another year or two. And and also, you know, who's got a better pedigree than the manager that we have at the moment? And who knows, maybe this be a year to kick on because we've talked before about this is definitely Davies last year, you know, in the past, and then he goes and wins a Leinster title or something. So we obviously have to to watch and, and let it play out a little bit. Another comment in here from John uh, DYDX. Do you think the GA will ever address the issue of how a player can tackle another player who's carrying the ball in hand? With more carrying the ball in hand these days, this gap is being exposed. That's true. Like, you are supposed to go and tackle for the ball, but there's a lot of sort of pulling and dragging and the half pull on the arm, which can slow a player up and stop him handing it off. If it's if it's just that split second thing, you as the ball carrier, it affects your ability to release it in a game of inches that can end up uh, leading to a turnover. But a referee, if he sees a pull like that, and he's and there's a, a whistle being blown every time. People in the crowd go nuts, and people on the field go nuts. So it's one of those tough ones where you could kind of get away with a half foul if you're cute enough, which leads to more and more of it, and then it becomes scrappy. Yeah, like when you go into a tackle now with two or three guys, how many times do you find that you just like you can't actually release your hand to hand pass the ball? And I know Martin Fogarty had a an interesting article on GA.ie last week, and was basically kind of saying that like this was being coached, which you know it's being coached. I know it's it being coached. It is it is being coached. And he was basically saying that, you know, people are going mad at referees. If you like if you don't want referees to call it, then stop coaching it and stop getting teams to do it. It is a really, really kind of a 
it's a the biggest grey area we've probably ever had in the GA is around the tackle in in Harlan. It's it's such a kind of a murky ground really about what you can actually do and you can't do. But I think even if you look at how Limerick adapted during the league, they started tackling differently. They started uh, not giving the referee the opportunity to blow. They started keeping their hands down an awful lot lower and having their hands in around the man, but not necessarily you know pulling or dragging or anything like that. So teams will adapt to it if referees are going to blow every time they think you know there's a little pull or anything like that. Teams just have to adapt to it or they're going to be killed on the scoreboard yeah the, that term uh, pulling and dragging I, I remember once this english girl asking me what's pulling the dragon <laughs> anyway, that we'll, could we'll, be construed as anything <laughs> oh jeez <laughs> i certainly didn't mean anything like that about it you're a horrible man at uh, least you get so we're both going with a dublin win there just about yeah just about yeah and people get your comments in and let us know if you agree or disagree and why, more importantly, as well, to give us that talking point. Leash against Wexford, that's going to be on in Nolan Park in Kilkenny. And you can't help but think that Niall Corker, and he was a selector with, uh, with the O'Moore County for the past couple of years, he's now on the other side of things. We've seen this in the past where someone might maybe take that intellectual property or insight, like Michal Dunne, who was part of Eamon O'Shea's setup in Tipperary, and then he went over to Galway as manager the next year and upset the Premier County. So is there going to be much value in what Niall Corcoran is going to know about this Leash team for Wexford, even though if you look at the league fixture, the models beat them out the gate 4.17 to 10 points? I think so, Shane. Yeah, it's a, you do. We have an intimate knowledge of, you know, what way Leash were playing last year, what different players, their kind of idiosyncrasies, what they do, what they don't like to do, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And you would be trying to go after them. Uh, like, no more than Niall Corcoran did it, would probably, I'm not saying that he did it, but he was obviously, he would know, would have known the Dublin players very, very well, having played with a lot of them. And I'm sure he used his knowledge to his benefit and Leash's benefit when they beat them in that uh, preliminary round quarter final in 2019. So yeah, like that's that's just the nature of it. Like if you have if you've been in a camp, you know what lads are good at and what they're not good at, and you have to use that to your best advantage. Uh, of course, one of the classic cases was probably Eamon Cregan with Offaly in '94. He was the Offaly manager that played Limerick. I'm sure he knew Limerick very, very well. I'm sure he didn't plan it that they were going to win it in five minutes at the end, but he would have, you know, would have imagined he would have known the Limerick players well what they what they do well, what they don't do so well, and would have tried to exploit it. Uh, so definitely, I definitely think there's a value in it, without without a doubt. Um, particularly when like Wexford are favoured to win this game, and a lot of things will have to go right for Leash. You'd imagine Ross King will have to have a game. Uh, Aaron Dunphy will have to have a game. A lot of those players will have to have big games, and I'm sure Corcoran and Davy Fitz and all these lads will be planning, you know, to really go after the Leash's big players. The, the players that Leash are going to need to play well to win, I'm sure there will be added focus on them from an extra point of view. If you look at the Wexford's results last year, and they lost 127 to 17 points against Galway. It was the manner of the defeat, no doubt about it. And then lost 121 to 17 points against Clare in Port Leash. So in both games, it was emphatic. There was, there was no question about it at all. Their previous championship game before that was a collapse against Tipperary in 2019. And I think it is fair to call it that. It's, you know, I mean, it's not like there was too much in the scoreline between the sides. But when you're four or five up and you're a man up, I think there's definitely ways to justify calling that a collapse. And in that 2019 season, they won a Leinster title by beating Carlo, by getting a few draws in the round robin, and then by brilliantly beating Kilkenny in the Leinster final. 2018 didn't go their way either. So in between that Leinster title, there have been plenty of games now where they haven't really performed in the championship. They were absolutely terrible in Nolan Park a few weeks ago, but I think they were selling us a pup in that game. The players looked absolutely jaded. I wonder were they in the middle of a big training block. But it's really, really important for Wexford to hit the ground running. And I'd say prove to themselves that we're ready for a championship when we meet a big team. Yeah, I don't think they can limp into the Kilkenny game. And I think they need to stride into the Kilkenny game. They need to pop a big performance. They've had the really had the, the strong hand on leash any time they played them, particularly under Davy. They've won by double digits nearly most days. And I think that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of display they need coming into the Kilkenny. Like I can't it's very it's very, very hard uh, to look past. Like you cannot look past uh, Wexford in this instance all evidence like Leash had a, had a very poor league Wexford didn't blow teams away in the league like that but they still beat Leash by 19 points like you cannot see that been turned around the result for Leash being realistic would be to keep it within 6 or 7 that's just been realistic 
Yeah, no, without doubt. There's a couple more comments coming in here. Why are all, says Paul Newtape, why are almost all the Limerick players monsters size wise? Can Watford ever win the Ireland, All Ireland without at least six to seven monsters, six foot four or more, 180 pounds plus? God, we deal in stone here in Ireland, so I'm not sure, even sure what 180 pounds is. <laughs> I'll look it up actually. It's, about, it's, only, it's only under about 13, it's under about 13 stone. I'd say it's about. Uh, it's about, yeah, it's just under 13. Yeah, yeah. yeah and like, listen, Limerick, Limerick have kind of a lot of monsters. Waterford don't necessarily have them, so you can only play with what you have. Uh, so Waterford, fairness, Waterford play a brand that suits their the style of player they have. That's what I love about certain managers, and uh, that's what I dislike about other managers. If you know, if you have a load of ball winners in their half hour line, and real, you know, real you know, dainty forwards and mixed with, you know, ball winning forwards, you can play way more direct. Like, that's just the nature of it. You have loads of out balls. If you have two or three lads that come in puck outs. So, but like, if you have lots of smaller players, you can't play that style. You have to change your style. And that's why I think some managers, particularly on the club circuit, are a bit of one-trick ponies. They play the same, uh, they have the same tactics. You know if they're coming into your into a club that they're going to play the sweeper, even though the sweeper might necessarily suit the teams that they have. So, with Waterford, uh, Waterford can only they can only play uh, and use the style of players that they have, and I, to me, I think to be honest with you, they're using it quite efficiently. Uh, Limerick have a different type of player. They have big, robust players, the likes of Will O'Donoghue, uh, the likes of Dermot Burns, the likes of Hegarty and Morrissey. So they can play a different type of game, and they can they can go far more direct because they have those types of players at their disposal. And some managers they just have to make do with what they have and try and. I mean, like we, we talked about Kieran Kingston, can he find a new way to, to to try and play with this team? Because what's the point in losing the same all way? And he's trying to work the ball out from the back. <clears throat> and I have to say, I think he's 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 dead right to persist. I admire that, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And it could absolutely bomb next weekend. Obviously, we'll preview that game next week. It could bomb next weekend. But yeah, you can understand why he'd do that. Tipperary, they have an awful lot of skillful players, but not too many pacey players when you compare it to the likes of Watford, to the likes of Cork, to the likes of Limerick as well. So Tipperary have to try and find something that suits them. And arguably that hasn't worked too well in the last year or so. Maybe they need to figure out another way to do it. Limerick have a lovely blend. And maybe that's why they're so good. I mean, there's lots of reasons why they're so good, but that's definitely part of it. And Galway have a really good blend. They have really skillful players. They have some very fast players. They have some very robust players. And they have lads who won't take a backward step. So when you have that nice balance, that's kind of, um, that very much helps your cause. Brian White, uh, lads, very worrying how much Leash have regressed this year. I know they're missing players, but if you look now, they're clearly the 11th team out of 11 in the Lee McCarthy Wexford to win by 10 points. Yeah, but the injury situation has kind of um, sorted itself out a little bit. They were missing an awful lot of players. They do have PJ Scully back in this year, Chow Dwyer back in. You were chatting to Ross King, their talisman this week. Yeah, yeah, he said, like, he said, uh, he's a, an agricultural rep. He works for Glambia, and he said, like, he doesn't like making excuses, like, but every year they seem to pick up these injuries that seem to keep lads out for three or four weeks. And he said that maybe he needs to get more beef nuts into them, I think were his exact words. But I think at the moment, as of last Friday, it was Parik Delaney, uh, Mark Kavanagh, and John Lennon, who look like they're going to miss championship action at the moment. They won't be playing as of, as of this moment in time. They haven't been training. So he actually said if that's if that's as long as the injury list stays, he'd be happy because at different stages during the league, they were missing seven or eight. Ian Lines was out, Willie Dunphy was out, Chad Dwyer was out, Picky Marr was out. So they seem to have a lot of guys available to them. Just a couple of good lines from Ross. It was great to it's great to chat to a, a county player. Uh, you know, eight days out from a championship game that would actually, you know, tell you what's on his mind and, and not pull any punches. And he was just talking about Cheddar returning. And he just says, I remember the day Eddie left. Myself and Ender Roland were chatting and we said, what are we going to do? And I had Cheddar's name in the back of my head straight away. I always wanted him back. It was kind of like two lads talking about a young one that they fancy, but they didn't want to say it out loud. I don't know who said his name first, but the other lad said, Jesus, I was going to say the same thing. And uh, he just said as well about... Um, like I was saying to ask him about Eddie Brennan, obviously if Eddie hadn't persisted with him, he would he would have missed that 2019 win. And he said, you know, as great as that 2019 win is, he was just said, we have to reset our sights and do it again. We have to do it sooner rather than later. Or else we're just going to be that owl lad in the pub saying how great he was back in the day. And that's all he did. So like they are keen to push on 
uh, the league was a bit of a disaster for them. You know, they never really looked like winning a game. They had a good comeback against Kilkenny in the second half, but left themselves too much to do. And same against Antrim. Antrim were always kind of had them just at arm's length. Fair, in fairness to Ross, like I, I imagine if I put this question to anybody else, I can imagine how they'd answer it. I said, like, what do you think of the Wexford game? And he just said, I think we have a great chance. Why can't we win that game? What stop, what's to stop us winning? We'll have a game plan to stop them and do as best we can. No matter who you're playing, if you don't believe you're going to win, you're at nothing, which is a really fair point. I believe we beat Limerick if we got a few weeks of training together, and that's probably disillusionment. And without that, what are you doing? Like, and uh, just an expletive there. If things click for us on the day, it's going to be tit for tat. It has to be. If we're not at that, then we're probably codding ourselves with all the things we talk about and dream about. If we're not backing it up, why are we doing it? And just fair questions and kind of putting it all on the line. So, like, if 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 they can bring a big performance. Um, they might put it up to Wexford because it's not a Wexford team that's absolutely flying, but it's just very, it's just very, very hard to see it. Really, in fairness, you're kind of hoping beyond hope that this will be a really game. You you expect yeah. Watford Clare is going to deliver us a good game. You expect Dublin Antrim will be, you know, skin and hair flying for a good while. Your concern with this is that if Lee Chin catches fire, if Rory O'Connor, who we keep saying looks like, you know, his form is all star form at the moment, if he catches fire, like, can they get the ball beyond? Kevin Foley you know the difference when he came in as a sweeper against Kilkenny on a day where they were absolutely beaten out the gate they won the second half by four points when they brought the likes of him onto the field it's just really hard to see where Leash can 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 sort of penetrate that team but you do want to see something from Wexford here I mean I said it already I was so frustrated watching them against Wexford or Kilkenny the way they set up that when the defenders came out they looked up the field and like I'm standing there in the stadium. This is obviously the the sort of uh, one of the shortcomings of watching games on TV, which I'm sure everyone is frustrated with there over the last year or so, is that you can only see the field of vision that you're given by the camera. So when I'm there at Nolan Park, I'm watching the likes of Joe O'Connor take a short puck out and solo out from the back. And I sort of look up the field to see what are his options there. And Mikey Dwyer, let's say, was full forward. And he had defenders all sides around him. You had the Wexford players kind of bunched into the middle or sitting back in and around their own 65, 45 area. And you're wondering, where can Joe O'Connor possibly hit this ball? There was nowhere for him to hit it. So you just want to see a little bit more direction in how Wexford are playing. It's energy, They're Shane, slipping. isn't it? It's energy. It's whether they have that energy. If they, like Their game is just so reliant on energy and enthusiasm. If it's not there, Leash have a chance. But a lot they of not, they don't off, have a chance. Yeah, Look, I mean, I don't. things are going to have to go right for for Leash to be like really like incredibly competitive in this game. This will be shock of the century, as far as I'm concerned. If if Leash won this game, and I do, I obviously don't wish them ill in any way, shape, or form. I hope they do go out and give it an absolute rattle. But based on everything we've seen, even though Wexford haven't been that impressive, even their win against Clare was a collapse due to a red card to Liam Corey for the banner. I just can't make a case for Leash winning this game going by what I've seen this year. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fair point. It's very hard to, and I, like, yeah, it's just very, very, very difficult to, and you, Leash need to, both teams need to step step on a bit, but Wexford, you'd imagine, like, I'd be surprised if it's not double digits. You'd imagine it would be double digits. Yeah, and MR7, Wexford need a big game from Conor McDonald. Haven't seen him operating that well since the All-Ireland semi-final against Tipperary. Scored a couple of goals that day, I think, on Ronan Maher. But Ronan Maher also absolutely bet ball out of ball, uh, ball after ball before him too. So A lot to do with the way he's played into the game. Like He's, he's usually uh, operating against three defenders. What sort of ball is he getting? As I say, we talked about ball down on top of him. Or diagonal ball. If like I, if you put him against anybody in the air with that diagonal kind of floating ball, I I would fancy him to win it. But they don't. To me, they don't use him to his you know to best effect. They're not playing to his strengths at the moment, and yeah. they need him and need Rory O'Connor and need Chin playing well. Yeah, and just a reminder, we're brought to you by Torpy and the Bamboo Hurley. You can get ten percent off with the promo code Our Game. The link to where you can buy that is in the the video description. And also, if you want to get the this podcast and all the Hurling Show podcasts on um, on audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Our Game, five euro a month. Let's move on now to the Joe McDonough Cup, Kildare against Carlo and Carrier against Down. I mean, again, this is skin and hair flying. We know that Kerry 
their prize if they were to win the Joe McDonough this year would be to go up into the Leinster Championship. It's an odd one, um, but maybe they feel like there's a bit more, you know, there's a few more winnable games in there. Maybe the GA are looking at that way. But Kildare, really, really impressive in the league. David Herity is uh, going great guns with them in Division 2B. Their scoring differential after winning four games from four was plus 77 points. So they're obviously going very well. Whereas Carlo, who were up in Division 2A, they came second, winning three games out of five. And in, in a division that Offaly absolutely dominated. And let's be honest, Offaly could well win Joe McDonough if they weren't down in the, Chris, uh, the, in the Christie ring. Yeah, no, fair point. I just put a question to you. Like, David Herity, uh, when they won the Christie ring last year with Kildare, talked about surviving at Joe McDonough level. I wonder, can they do more than survive? They're in an awful group with uh, with Carlo and Westmead, and if Carlo the opening weekend, it is at home. I just wonder, can they do more than survive? And are they a bit of a dark horse? Uh, Carlo had a couple of good results in the league, but were beaten by down in the league. Uh, a real good performance against Kerry in the last game. Uh, Westmead, you know, lost all their games comprehensively in Division One. Looks like they're missing Davy Glenn, and I think Killian Doyle is going to be out by all accounts as well. I wonder, I wonder, can they do a bit more than survive? Because when you put down on paper some of the players that they have, like they've they've a right good squad assembled, and I just I'd be interested in seeing now if they can do a bit more than survive. What do you think? Ah, uh, I I I want I want them to do more than survive. They played awfully last weekend. And they shipped. Uh, I think it was. I think it was two thirty nine to two twenty one. Uh, they were they were beaten, which is interesting because that's an awfully team coming from the Christie Ring playing against uh, a Kildare team that are playing a division ahead of them. I think if they'd been in the other group with Kerry and Down and Mead, I think they'd have a great shot of getting to the final. I think they're in an awful group, but that's a really interesting game against Carlo. Like I've talked to you se- several times about you know the quality of player that Kildare have. They have seven or eight like really, really good players. And uh, I, I think it's a bit unfortunate the group they've ended up in. And if they end up at the bottom of that group, they play the bottom team in the other group and the loser goes back down to Christy Ring. So if they can get a win and at least stay safe, I think that's the most important thing for, uh, for Kildare. On the Kerry Down game, this is essentially, uh, this is essentially who's going to top the group. Because I fancy, you'd fa- have to fancy both of them to beat Mead. So whoever wins this game will be in the final. So this game is absolutely huge for both. Um, as I said, Kerry will go into the Leinster Championship if they win this game. The The only reason for that is there's no round robin in Munster this year. So that ridiculous playoff clause where they play the bottom team in Munster to get a chance to play in Munster is gone this year. So if they if they win the Joe McDonough this year, they're straight into the Leinster Championship. They have a great shot at a final. They, to me, this is this is a semi final essentially. It's only the top two qualify for the final. So a massive carrot dangling in front of Kerry and down. Yeah, you you probably would have fancied Kerry to win this if it was this time last year. But going through the league, and we've already mentioned that Carlo got three wins from their five games uh, under Tom Mullally, but also Down got the same amount of points, and did, and Kerry did as well. So it's probably fairly finely poised in a lot of ways. Maybe not everyone would agree and get your comments in, but uh, definitely not um, definitely not a foregone conclusion there. SSRI one super club in Kildare hurling Nace while the others are struggling, might not be good long-term for Kildare Hurling. And Brian White, Joe McDonough is wide open, carrier favourites, but I fancy Westmead with their Division 1 experience. So that's the, the Joe McDonough Cup. Unless you have any final thoughts on that one? No, on. no, I, I do think they're two of the more, most interesting games of the weekend. If anything, I'd have more interest in those two than I would in, in Leash and uh, Wexford. I think they're huge games, have massive, uh, massive ramifications for the McDonough. Mm, uh, Ross King won't be the ans- answering the phone to you again after that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your former county Wicklow out against Ross Common this weekend in the Christie Ring Cup. Do you, how do you see this one going? Just to reflect on how they both did in the league. Wicklow they finished bottom of Division Two A and were relegated, whereas Ross Common were Division Three and they lost all their games. So both of these and they're going down to Three A for next year. So between the two of them, they've played nine games this year and not won a single one. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one when you look at it, like they're both coming in with. You wouldn't think too much confidence into this game. Wicklow shipped like Wicklow shipped a huge defeat to an awfully B team essentially in their la- in their last league game, and Wicklow had a strong team out. Uh, they would, you know, traditionally over the last decade they would have uh, they would have been beating Roscommon most times. They've been beating them, but as I say, confidence coming in at probably an all time low. 
Um, they're both happy, I'm sure, to be on the opposite side of Offaly. So it's a, the ring is a really funny one. There's five teams in it this year. Offaly and Sligo are in one group, even though it's only two of them. There's three on the other side. It's it's one of these competitions that it's harder to get out of it than to get into it. Like if Offaly uh, beats Sligo, they're in the semi final. Sligo are still in a quarter final, even though they finished bottom of the group. It's the same on the other side. Like. I, 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 literally it's nearly impossible to get out of the competition uh, or be knocked out of the competition I would fancy Wicklow to win uh, I would fancy to Wick, Wicklow to win just because they were playing higher grade at the league um, they should win but they should win by four or five but yeah neither team's coming in with too much confidence you'd have to say mm, and in Nicky Racker Cup there's there's two groups one group with Donegal, Mayo, Leitrim Donegal will play Mayo this weekend group B is Armagh and Tyrone which is basically going to be one game I wonder is there other structures they could have looked at uh, for this one but Donegal are against Mayo they were both in the same division this year which was 2B and they both got a couple of wins here both finished on a minus uh, score and differential as well. So maybe this game could be tight. But uh, are you back in Keith Higgins as captain here to get it done with Mayo? No, I'm probably not. No, Donegal beat them in the record final last year and they beat them in the league this year after me saying uh, Donegal shipped a big defeat to Kildare in the first round and I think I basically wrote them off and uh, they annihilated Mayo when they had them, even though Higgins was missing. This will be tight and I'd be amazed if this is not... Uh, you know the first the first of two games that they played they should meet in the final again they they look to be by far the two strongest teams in the record so i'd be amazed if they don't meet in the final again yeah and uh the Laurie maher cup is thrown in this weekend we actually spoke with the monaghan hurling manager cahill macker lane last week he uh, runs the ga fantasy league so fantasy and fantasy gaelic football.com go there if you want to join the our game diehards league Battle it out with myself and Michael Verney. Still time to get your teams. You in copied there. all my team too. We did a we did a video we did a video preview of Cotton last week, and I had a couple of nice little nuggets. And sure, maybe I probably should have kept them to myself, but that's not that's not my nature. Uh, and all of a sudden, your team started to resemble mine by, by the end of it. I might make some late transfers before the match on Saturday. I'm definitely doing so too, yeah. And I tell you what, I won't be publicising the meter. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two groups in the Laurie Maher this year. Longford, Loud and Monaghan are in one group. And you will see Longford against Loud this weekend. And the other side is Cavan against Fermanagh. And they'll be playing the week after here. So uh, obviously neither of us would have seen too much of Loud or Longford this year. But um, Loud, won it la Loud won it last year when there was only three teams in it. Uh, Longford and Monaghan are both coming back from the record, so you'd imagine it would be between Loud Longford and Monaghan. I, I tipped up Long, uh, Monaghan to win it in the pa in the paper. Not that that means much, but uh, it should be an interesting one. And at least there's not the three teams that were in it last year. Like it was essentially just like you know top two in the final last year from that group of three. So at least it should be more competitive this year. Yeah, um, Louth, they're on an upward trajectory, like you said, after winning silverware last year and they're after getting promotion up from Division 3B, whereas Longford won draw from four games in the league and, and shipped a couple of significant enough beatings along the way as well. So maybe that'll tip it the way of Louth with, uh, with the confidence going into that game. So I think that's about the height of it for the Hurling Show this Thursday, brought to you by the bamboo stick from, uh, from Torpy. Any other final thoughts before we head into championship action? Skin and hair flying. Yeah, no, I can't wait for it. Uh, that 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 water for Claire game. Really looking forward to that. There's so many different questions. I even like it sometimes when you're not focusing on too many games in a weekend. Like that's just such a game to look forward to. If there were two or three other games of Cork were playing Limerick or that, you might mightn't focus on water for Claire as much. But no, I expect that to be an absolute belter. Real, real, real high scoring game, similar to the one they played uh, last year down in Parky Cueve. Yeah, and don't forget, if you want to get this on an audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. You'll get all the hurling shows there and the Gaelic football shows for a fiver a month. Thanks very much, Michael. Cheers, Jen. The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code RGAME to get yourself 10% off.
That's some image, lad.